epicenter of the Museums at Night Festival here in Liverpool. It's called the Light Nights here, and you can see why. It's fantastically exciting to see this huge Victorian plaza, chock full of culture, literally a blaze. The whole city is lighting up. The cathedral is filled with sacred lights and psychedelic chants, illuminations and projections, and countless more shows, exhibitions, and performances across the city. The galleries, the museums, the streets, they're all packed with people. These big Victorian buildings are the heart and soul of this city, and the reason that Museums at Night is so special here. To get myself in the mood, I've been revisiting some of the city's cultural landmarks by God's Own Daylight. Wherever you go in Liverpool, you're never far from world-class art. This is Crosby Beach. If you arrive in or leave Liverpool by sea, you do so under the unblinking gaze of a hundred metal statues of and by Anthony Gormley. They stir out to the sea lanes down which money once poured into the city, where lots of it was spent on the museums and the galleries. 15 minutes drive from Gormley's installation, and I'm here again in William Brown Street. Even in the cold light of day, this 12-acre stretch of art and artefacts is still impressive. These galleries and museums on William Brown Street are civic celebrations of immense wealth. They're saying, in their Victorian way, we own the world and everything in it, and we're going to rule the world. These statues are not of local boys. That's Raphael. That's Michelangelo. This is the new Florence. This is the new Greece. This is the new Rome. This is power. This is the Picton Reading Room. Incredibly grand structure with its classic Corinthian columns. But the people took it and made it their own. But as a kid, what I remember is that that is also where the newspapers were. So that is where unemployed old men used to come and fill out their betting slips and they'd study the form in the newspapers. So although this street is very imposing it's somehow not very intimidating it's a very open democratic space as a kid you were allowed to come into town because you were going to the museum or the art gallery and your mum and dad knew you were safe and it was free and it was warm so maybe that's part of the strange kind of reverse alchemy of liverpool that you can bring high culture here and the city will immediately turn it into popular culture so these buildings that began as kind of elite shows of power are now the property of the people. But in the 20th century, the end of empire, wars, strikes and recession turned parts of Liverpool into a ghost town. I can remember when this was completely derelict, when it was just a dark, forbidding, place with cliffs of blackened stone and no one could go there. But then, in 1988, the Tate opened a contemporary art gallery in the Albert Dock. And everybody went, what? Because the last thing we thought that the city needed at that point was a warehouse full of abstract expressionism. Culture went where politics had failed and where economics had failed, and it lit this little light and it illuminated this beautiful shared public space. 75,000 people visited the Tate in the first two days. Culture isn't just for when you've got an empire and you're dominating the world. Culture is for when times are tough. The best art comes out of the toughest times because it's during the toughest times that we most need the solace of art. This is the two-year-old Museum of Liverpool. For museums at night, this building is celebrating a little-known local hero, Charles Plimpton. Never heard of him? Me neither. But I know a man who has. This is Pete Bradley, known as the Baco Man, head of the Baco Collectors Club. This is a piece of Baco, and this is what you do with it. Baco was a children's toy invented by Plimpton and produced in Liverpool from the 1930s. Back in the day, this was the future. It was made 
of a state-of-the-art plastic called Bakelite. This year is the 80th anniversary of Bako's invention, so for museums at night, the Bako Collectors Club are planning a birthday extravaganza. Well, it's going to be an amazing display. We've got club members coming from all over the country bringing models like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Sir Mark's Campanile. We're going to have a model railway display. Anything that you can think of, somebody will have built something of that ilk. Bako architects from across the land have brought their Baconite dreams here to the Museum of Liverpool to be appreciated. Here's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, St Mark's Campanile, and Peter's own 32-foot-long pier. It's nostalgic, it's touching, it's a little bit bonkers. But what a great tribute to its inventor, Charles Plimpton, Liverpudlian, man of the future. Nostalgia is part of the pleasure of museums, but some things from the past are less easy to love. Take the Churchill Way flyover, a tangle of concrete that is nevertheless playing a big part in the cultural drama of light night. It was built in the late 1960s, just behind the museums of William Brown Street. In its own way, it's a museum piece too now, but some people want to knock it down. 1971, this flyover won the hotly contested, much coveted Concrete Society Award. And obviously, it's horrible. It's falling to pieces, it's weathered really badly, bits are coming off it, and people want to knock it down. But there is a magic in here that could be woken up. And a growing number of people are beginning to feel the same way. There are plans to turn it into a magical sky wall, wrapping itself around the road system like a coloured ribbon. And isn't that the role of culture? To find the magic that are in things and to wake it up and to make the things that we were stuck with, the things that we have to live with, to make them beautiful. Ta-da! The Churchill Way flyover with the lights on. I rest my case.